partnerships are widespread in the tech industry for good reason. They pay off. According to a HubSpot report, 65% of organizations view partnerships as essential to their future growth, and 50% attribute 26% or more of the revenues to partners. The report also found that 77% of surveyed organizations have technology partners, and tech partnerships were ranked as the most important partner type. Obviously, a well-known example is Microsoft, so I'm curious. Is creating technology partnerships something that all companies and perhaps tech companies in particular should be prioritizing? What are the pros and cons of it? And how can we leverage some of the success that bigger players like Microsoft have been able to benefit from? We'll be exploring that in just a bit. Hello, and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast brought to you by SproutWord.com. I'm Vinay Koshi, and I guess today is Raj Gorbat. Raj, you're the founder, founding partner and CEO at Actuate, which is a boutique advisory firm that helps innovative companies accelerate revenue through strategy, business development, and disruptive technology partnerships. And you work with a team that has a unique combination of strategists, operators, and technologists who are quite passionate about creating a better future through your work. You've actually spent a fair amount of time in supporting deep tech startups and enterprises and have earned something of a reputation in developing effective go-to-market strategies, lucrative deals. In fact, you've got a, a list of clients uh, that include the likes of Verizon, sorry, Verizon, uh, Deutsche Telekom, Lenovo, Samsung, Apple, HTC, just to name a few. I'm, I'm curious though, uh, given the kind of deals that you've structured, was there a, a particular event or incident that triggered this journey to create, to actuate to what it is today? Great question. So it wasn't an event. I think it was more of a journey. Mm -hmm. And prior to actuate, I was running a startup called Clay Air. It was a computer vision AI company uh, doing a lot of tracking technology out of cameras. Mm -hmm. And so I was on the technology partner side often trying to navigate uh, these larger incumbent tech companies and figure out how we could fit into their roadmap and their plans. And so I, I saw the friction firsthand and watch those companies try to go through uh, finding a technology partner. I also was a consultant in 2013 to 15, working with some of those same kinds of large tech companies like Samsung and HTC on technology partnerships as a consultant. So I, I'd seen it. And then at the startup that I ran, I'd, I would say I felt the pain of it being on the other side. And that sort of is what inspired me saying there could be a better way to do this. And that was the initial impetus for actually. Oh, probably. And Given your journey to date, uh, what would you say would be your personal area of strength? My core strength is probably relationship building. Mm -hmm. I'd say I love being around people. I find that like I can sometimes uh, relate to a lot of different kinds of characters, cultures, and age types. I think that's just because of the way I grew up. I'm Armenian American, I'm empathetic to a lot of different kinds of cultures and curious. I grew up with an older brother, so that helped me relate to older people who were better as I was growing up. And so, yeah, I, I find that that's probably like my core strength and that helps me. It doesn't matter what I'm working on. It always helps relate to the person, right? Okay. Brilliant. And in that area of strength, what would you say is something that businesses don't know, but should? In that area of strength? Yeah, I think from what I've seen, especially in the larger companies, this is so hard. To, to get better at it. It just happens naturally. But they forget that like each person who's working at the company is an individual who's a human. And too often, it's just this corporate culture that uh, forces people from that very idea of, hey, like, this person is, is a human, let's connect with them on a human level mm -hmm. and take time to do that. I think that's become something that is, yeah, it's too commonplace just to see people not being treated like as humans and understanding they have families. And it's okay to connect on that level as well too. And that's important because at the end of the day, like this group of humans working together. So I think that's forgotten too often. Now in this area of working with startups, what would you say are the common and most common areas startups overlook when 
seeking technology partnerships and what can this lack mm. of preparation cost them? The most, take a step back and think about it, who those startups are. Oftentimes they're technical founders mm-hmm. and uh, I think that generally speaking, I think their biggest mistake is not being able to qualify in or out a given opportunity. What I often see is a technical founder having seven, eight months of conversation, and let's say with a big PC manufacturer, I'm making that up. And they've had eight months of calls and meetings, but there's just like basic things that still have yet to be done, but more on the business side. Hmm. So that could have been a term sheet, thinking through the pricing model or business model, thinking about what products this is actually going to plug into, a roadmap of some sort. Oftentimes it's this back and forth of technological demos, technical Q and A, knowledge sharing, but they're not really pushing a deal forward so mm-hmm. say, or proposing terms quickly enough or figuring out who are the other stakeholders on the technology mm-hmm. partner side that like need to make decisions mm-hmm. to move a deal forward. It's a lot of these business components that are missing from the conversation that should be happening way earlier than they are. Yeah. Uh, so if I could put this uh, another way, and please feel free to sure. correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost imperative that we create a mutual action plan, assuming that there is an interest to take this further, to explore the opportunity. Would that be correct? Yeah, absolutely. A mutual action plan that's balanced between technology and business. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, do you have an example when a partnership really backfired or failed due to not properly evaluating compatibility criteria up front, uh, what was the aftermath like? That's a great question. Drew, because at Clay, it was my job to make sure like that did, never, that, that did not happen. <laughs> yeah. Right. But there, look, there, there were plenty of scenarios where early on, where working with, let's say a device manufacturer where like our technology just wasn't like really compatible just yet. And so it was just a lot of wasted time maybe six months of conversations where in that case, like this, the technology compatibility for what they wanted users to be able to do with the technology and what we had just wasn't there just yet. Mm-hmm. But so I, I thought it was a little bit too much of spinning wheels when it's not ready, but just as a technology partner, you're really trying to, to push it, get it. And then eventually like other priorities take over, other people get involved. So there's a lot of turnover and change. And basically the cost there is not as much money because it wasn't as money transacted hands, but it was time wasted and time. Let's be honest, like it's something you can never get back. So it's even more expensive and then money can be. So I think that's an example where you have to really be honest about technology is one important thing. And if it's not there, if it's not ready, mm-hmm. come back later sometimes. That's okay. Go find what a use case where the technology is ready for. It can get way worse. It can get way worse, right? Where other things happen, where the technology does make sense, you get further down the line, and then all of a sudden, you didn't evaluate whether or not that company has the ability to scale or has the right security protocol. And then now you've spent money, you've signed deals, and you're into this thing, and then it falls apart. Mm -hmm. So luckily, I I can't say I've firsthand had those kinds of experiences, but I've heard of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So with this idea of uh, technology partnerships, I would assume that in a startup scenario, they're primarily founder led to a large extent, but would you say that there is perhaps merit in entertaining someone who's had experience with channel partnerships drive some of this or help drive some of this? I think it's going to depend on the deal. Right. I believe that especially if we're talking about earlier stage B2B technology partnerships, most likely the case that it makes sense for the founder to be really involved, at least. Mm -hmm. These are very strategic agreements that have three, four year long cycles or term lengths to them Mm -hmm. and require usually like a lot or a considerable investment and they could be, they could set precedent for other deals that you're working on. So I wouldn't say that this is something that a founder should outsource to a channel partner's professional for the first deal. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that if they have two or three under their belt, 
and they've set some nice terms that they understand what the, uh, those engagements look like and they know how to negotiate them, then it makes sense to start evaluating who can do it for them. What about the aftercare? Because uh, a, a lot of hype tends to go around the initial partnership, but I'm assuming that there is a fair amount of work that needs to go into the, the continuing the relationship and building it out, which I don't know if I'm not necessarily in the right space, but I often find that it gets glossed over a fair bit. Would that be a fair comment? And if so, does it require a, a almost different mindset? to really bring this to fruition. It does. Whoever can take an opportunity like that and make it come to fruition and mm -hmm. sign an agreement like that is likely not always the same person who can yep. carry it through. Let's say, let's ground it a little bit. Let's say if it's a piece of machine learning software that needs to plug into a device with a company like LG, huge device manufacturer. It's 12 to 18 months to get that kind of, maybe even longer, 24 months to get something like that done. But then now it's like, hey, we need to get the product people involved, the engineers involved, customer success needs to get a project management, needs, needs mm -hmm. to be involved to really drive this thing forward. I think it's best actually to make sure that those original folks who help close the deal are also carried through a little bit. So there's some incentive there for them to do that. It's not... Like any other kind of deal, it's not great when that person who closes it just all of a sudden disappears, mm. right? And they're a, a really important stakeholder. So the founder, if that was the founder, needs to check in and be involved and make sure there's success. And I highly recommend defining what success means as early as possible, but making that super clear and as quantitative and objective as possible in the actual agreements that are signed. And just making sure that you're keeping track with that on schedule, mm -hmm. like whether you're behind or ahead and like keeping that momentum going is super important because sometimes people just, they just market around that and then it just drifts away. And that can happen. What would you say are the core processes that have proven most critical for startups to nail in order to accelerate their fundraising efforts and revenue growth mm -hmm. predictably? Ask that again, the co the co processes that need to happen. As yeah, they're in that, that, are, yeah. that are proven to be most critical. Yeah. One thing, let me just start with the problem. I think oftentimes what I see happening with founders who are trying to raise, uh, they, it looks something like this. They do like maybe five or six pitches a month <laughs> over five, six months. And it slowly gets better over time. The business is changing considerably because they're actually working on the business. And then there's a challenge with that because now every two, three weeks, you have another investor conversation. Their pitch necessarily is changing because the business has been changing. Mm -hmm. And that just means that you're not really well practiced and well polished in what you were saying and what you were not saying. Right? And also you have no momentum in that investor deal and there's seasons to fundraising. So it needs to be done differently. And... Uh, First and foremost, what needs to happen is, is preparation before you even start to have too many investor sessions. And that preparation is going to include elements that are super important for knowing how to message your, your business. It's going to include your classic pitch deck, a shorter version of that, a teaser deck, a blurb that describes your business, right? Those things need to be like very well perfected. There's other stories that need to be developed as well too. Mm -hmm. So introducing especially if it's early stage, introducing who the founder is, what their background is, a little bit more personal and professional. Mm -hmm. And then what is the vision of the company when it's a billion dollars if we're talking about venture capital investors? So what's the, how do you paint that picture? I love using like the Netflix example, how they would have painted Netflix. It was 2005. What would they have mm -hmm. said about what it is now? And then finally, that, that go-to-market story as well is really critical. How you go from where you are now and let's say in three phases, how are you going to get to billion dollar valuation, right? So all that takes, if you do it pretty quickly, you can do it in three weeks. Mm -hmm. But I think it's like usually four to six weeks of review, deliberation, practice of how you're going to say it, what word you're going to use and not use, because mm -hmm. those words matter. Then at that point, you're ready to get the, the right introductions and the right meetings on the calendar. And in my opinion, that can be done in two different ways. 
I call it like inside out or outside in. Inside out is you are asking, I think this is an underrated approach. You go to your warm network and you ask them if they know any investors that meet the following criteria. And you ask your network who knows you well to actually think of who those investors might be. And the beautiful part about that is that it may not be as strategic of an investor, but going back to relationship building, whoever knows you best and know someone else really is a really strong intro in, the, in this like very noisy world we're in right now. That's pretty differentiated versus the outside in approach of getting an investor calls on the calendar, which is more so let me go find who the most strategic investor is for this type of technology that I'm working on or market that I'm going into. And then let me find how I'm connected to them. And then you just keep pinging these 10 or 15 mutual connections and you see what the strongest bridge is. And that, that takes a lot more time, but at least when you get the investor on the calendar, that they are more likely a better fit in some ways, but the relationship may not be as strong. So it's just a trade off in these two approaches. I recommend getting 40 investor meetings on the calendar. Wow. Okay. You got to do 40 and you got to batch it and you got to do it in two to three weeks. I do recommend maybe five or six practice calls before venturing off of those 40 to refine things a bit, but that's what it should look like. Four to six weeks of prep. Hmm. maybe three or four weeks of outreach to get the calendar set up for two to three weeks. And then you're going to be doing another month or two of trying to push them through a funnel, track them, close them, get one, and then go chase all the others who hmm. more likely to not put you on the sideline and said, yeah, check in later. So all in all, that's maybe three to six months, but I wouldn't recommend people doing these too much in parallel to use that going back to co-processes, it's like work on your materials. Do that, throw in through four to six weeks, practice for two weeks, outbound and setting up meetings for another four to six weeks, and then drive to close. Yeah. And when advising founders on marketing uh, and marketing sales, no. uh, well, what do you see most people go wrong first, the struggle the most? Uh, I think what's underrated is having a strong offer. An offer is where the, the magic happens, right? And mm -hmm. so taking the time to think that through is going to help test whether or not this is the right market for you. And yeah, just getting to that more quickly, because I think oftentimes companies will spend like six to nine months testing a certain market out. And they, maybe it could have been done in three by having a really solid offer in place and just like putting that in front of people faster and seeing whether it's yes or no, mm -hmm. right? And thinking about that and then Thinking about how it changes from market to market, I think is a little bit underrated. There's too much, too many people do like too much customer discovery. Let's interview customers. It's not great. Awesome. Mm. But like at some point, the best customer discovery is asking for a sale. Right. right. And that comes down to an offer. That's the signal. So when you say offer, are you uh, suggesting that they uh, ensure that they have a unique value proposition that resonates? The value proposition as well as, yeah, it's the value proposition as well as what the pricing is, what they're going to get for that and over how long, what kind of ROI can they, to your point, value prop, what kind of ROI can they expect to get if they pull the trigger, mm -hmm. right? Like just putting that in front of someone, be like, look, it's going to, if it's B2B SaaS, it's going to be this many seats at this price for over a year and just get there quickly and, and compare what your offer is to others. And then really do some theory of mind stuff where you sit, you imagine yourself in the customer's shoes, like, would I, would I buy this? Right. Just on face value, would I buy this? And how is it like way better than what the other options are out there? Right. Oftentimes, if you just have some differentiated, differentiated technology, great. Awesome. But explain that into a business marketing offer that, that lets that value be realized and is quick to understand. So people just get it and they can make a decision, right? If you had to boil down revenue success to one formula or framework, what would be the key components and what role does each play? Ask it one more time. Sure. You don't mind. If you had to boil down revenue success to one formula or framework, what would the key components be and what yeah. role does each play? It's a great point. I, I think 
It's so many, but I'm thinking through average revenue for customer. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking through how recurring that revenue can be, mm -hmm. how reliable it is over time. How much length does it have to it? So in other words, how predictable is it? How many different customers are you getting that revenue from? So mm -hmm. if it's just from a couple, that's great, but it's also really risky. Yeah. How fast can you close the revenue? Is it booked? When is it realized? How often is it paid? Is, is it monthly? Is it quarterly? Is it annually? How much upside is there to those agreements? Is it fixed, variable, or guaranteed? These are the things that you know really matter. How fast can it grow year over year? So those are the kinds of elements I'm thinking through when I'm thinking through a business's revenue. There was a second half to your question though, like which ones are most important? Or uh, yeah, what, what role does each uh, component play? Yeah. It depends on the business to the level of importance, of course, but I think I spoke to it a little bit already. When, some, when revenue is really recurring, it's beautiful because especially when you're trying to ever sell the business, it's just recurring revenue that has a long tailwind to it that's pretty predictable and doesn't have a lot of churn uh, from customers. It's just going to, it's going to have a better multiple to it and have a better valuation, right? The cost of that revenue is also important, of course. Like how much is it in terms of timing, in terms of dollars to get that revenue in the door, the lower it is, obviously the better, right? And then we talked a little bit about the frequency in which dollars are entering business. I think more frequent is, is better, right? Mm -hmm. If you're doing these technology partnership deals though, sometimes those can be more quarterly. And, and as part of that, especially when you're doing it with a larger company, there's, there's sometimes these risks involved of actually making sure you're getting paid the right way mm. uh, from the right people. So it's something to consider as well. So yeah, in all cases, it's, it's good to look at these different factors of revenue and just map them up with risk, right? That's ultimately what we're going after and looking at is like, how do we de-risk the revenue coming into the business? That's a key point there. On all the technologies you work with, uh, which mm -hmm. are, as you include things like AI, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, which seems most ripe with greater business potential in the next three years. So I'm definitely a little bit biased on this question. Mm -hmm. I think there is no doubt that that AI, everyone's focusing on LLMs right now, and I think that's going to mm -hmm. continue to disrupt. But so in the next three, three years, that probably might be what changes things the most in businesses and changes the productivity and the way people can output at least content is going to radically change. But I think if you ask me what it would be in like five to 10 years, I don't think actually it's just AI. Yeah. I think the biggest changes happen when interfaces change. And I don't believe AI LLMs on its own. Some people think that it's, it means there is an interface change in terms of how we do computing. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that. I think there's a little bit of that from LLMs, but not nearly as much as what spatial computing, for, for example, can offer. And so computing platforms are really what change the game the most in any kind of technology you can look at. It's computing mm -hmm. platforms that change the game the most. That's why Apple is the most valuable company mark by market cap, right? Mm -hmm. And the next computing platform will be spatial in nature. It will be the merging of digital and physical. People might call that metaverse, people might call that augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality. But the combination of that with AI will be, it will completely change how we process information and how we produce it. And it's in closing that gap that would have like disruptive change for businesses and for consumers. In short, next three years, LLMs, next five to 10 years, spatial. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah, you just mentioned reducing partnership risk and in an earlier conversation, I remember you mentioned using frameworks to showcase requirements and reduce partnership risk. Mm. Could you walk us through some of the key elements of what that canvas includes? Sure. Roughly anywhere from like 13 to 15 different things, right? Mm. Depending on the business, but... You want to be looking at um, business elements like the business model, of the technology partner, how do they make money? Like you want to be looking at what kind of, and this is more from the standpoint of the business who's trying to find a technology partner, right? Mm -hmm. 
You want to be considering their startup, their survivability, for example, how much runway do they have? You want to be thinking through what other partnerships they've already done and what other customers they already have. And is that strategic to you or not? Is there any conflicts of interest there? Right? You also want to be thinking about um, the timing. Like we talked about that as an example. Is this the right time to be partnering with them? And uh, is it too early? Is it too late? Maybe, right? Mm -hmm. So those are things to consider. Where the company is located is, I think, something that's underrated as well. Like that can create time zone differences, cultural differences, which is critical to understand right. as well, too. If, for example, security protocols are, are important, right? You want to evaluate that on the technology part. You want to also look to see they scale. Do they have enough of what you need if you need to go, you know, big into certain regions or different markets, for customers? So that's another thing to, to look at as well, too. Um, of course, there's all the technology and product fit questions you need to evaluate, especially for mm. product partnerships, a product partnership you need to look at. You need to have your engineers get in there and realize, hey, is this going to be able to work? Is it not? What kind of NRE is required if it isn't going to work? And we need to fix some things before we go commercial with them. So uh, these are some of the elements. Uh, I think the most underrated thing of those, all of those elements is probably culture. People just okay. avoid it. They don't think of going back to relationships and bias that way. Technology partnerships are hard, right? It's not the same as being vertically stacked in a company, right? Where things are a little bit easier because it's all within a company. And sometimes when you go horizontal like that and you partner, you need to make sure you have a really strong relationship with that partner, right? It makes you feel like it's almost during the same company, same mission, there's alignment. And so looking at what kind of culture that company has and making sure there's alignment there, it's a that's some of the work I do is I, I provide some taxonomies for that and, and, and measure for that a bit, right? So at least even if you have a different culture, you, you're aware of it and you can cater to that and be ready, right? So would you say that most startups, so at least those in the startup phase, uh, actually develop time to culture within their own organizations? Develop what? Sorry. Uh, actually spend time to develop their own culture and perhaps codify it? Not really. Yeah. I think it's something that is, it's just, it's usually not written down. Your cult, the culture is, to me, is what are like the unsaid things and in your business that make people do what they do, how they do it and why. And you need to, maybe if they're not even told. And, and I think it's those principles, if you will, that you need to write down so you understand the shared beliefs. And uh, yeah, I think it's something that's overlooked. And it makes sense. Look, you're doing so many things in a startup. It's, if you're early enough stage, you just have to make sure you survive and you have something of relevance in the, in the market. If you're sitting there and codifying your culture, I think that's something that's nice to have, right? right but when there. you get into these, but really when you get into these like technology partnership agreements, then it's something that is important for you mm. to start to look for, identify in yourself and with the business you might be partnering with. Hey, yeah, certainly. Uh, so when building a go-to-market strategy, what aspect do you find usually requires the most education and guidance for new, newer founders? I noticed that uh, some of the founders I work with, they, they don't have a process, right? They're not thinking through it a little bit more analytically. And I, although it's a startup, like it's okay to be a little bit more analytical. And by that, I just get out a, get out a spreadsheet and think through the columns that make a market that's interesting for you to enter based on what your constraints are and what your capabilities are. So let's look at the market. Let's look at the market size. Let's look at how fast it's growing. What is that market or customer's willingness to pay? Uh, do you have access to them? These are the kinds of things to think through. So set up the columns and then start generating those offers that make sense and start like defining what does success look like in each one of those. So you might do a simple filter rank and relative score for each of those. You know what? It really, let's say it's some computer vision software, right? Okay. It really makes sense for us to enter, let's say, not making this up. We're going to go try to partner with like wireless carriers on an initiatives there for deployments in IOT or something. Okay, we'll write that down and then compare that to another market you can enter and see which one scores higher. Mm. From there, put together the offer and then 
go put that in front of as many of those stakeholders as you can and see if it hit success. If it didn't, okay, rotate out and do the next one and re recalibrate and keep track of your assumptions as you were going through that. So you can see what's changing and, and how you're learning. Because all this go to market stuff or in the early stages for technology startups, it's experimentation. Hmm. We can't be perfectly scientific about it, but it's good to at least have some guardrails in place where you can at least take notes of, of what's going on, right? Absolutely. Yep. So have you seen any disruptive startups fail or perhaps even struggle to gain traction because they didn't quite craft the right narrative for their advanced technology? I want to be careful with that one. I'm trying to think who comes to mind that would have failed that had really advanced technology. I don't want to pick, let's see, I'm trying to think of who to pick without picking on them too hard. Okay. Or you can leave up the name if you feel that's more comfortable. Okay. There was a company that had really advanced technology in the XR space, let's say. I'll be the best out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the challenge was they did not really listen to what the needs were of the market. And I'm being a little bit vague with who they were, but they consistently were optimizing for the best tech and they did have it, mm -hmm. but they didn't listen to any of the other needs of uh, the kinds of products they were trying to plug into. So they were thinking of it as like middleware. So really advanced, great tech, but if it doesn't integrate with the rest of the product that's required yeah. to make that technology useful, it's almost that analogy it would be like, I have the best peanut butter out there, but it doesn't taste well with bread. So who cares? And so they, they faced those challenges where the technology wouldn't integrate well with the rest of the hardware they were trying to fit into. Or just had a lot more friction around it. And I think that doesn't help, right? So having really advanced technology is great, but if you are not going to be the one to put it into an end product yourself to make the product great, then you at least have to be some company that's listening very well to what these technology partners would want to partner with you on and how you fit into the rest of the product. And I think that is something that it's really, truly best case scenario up to the founders to do that. You can hire for it, but it's not yeah. recommended. You have to do that yourself. And that's challenging because if you're a technology technical founder, oh. then you're really focused on optimizing your model a little bit more this way. And uh, you're not really paying attention to like, how does this fit in to the rest of a product? And what do those stakeholders care about? And then how is an end user actually going to end up picking this up? And if that's not done correctly, if that user experience isn't strong, it's no one cares that your technology was that great anymore, right? It's just been buried under a bad product. Yeah, that's where my mind goes to. So, so what would be your advice for appropriately scoping out the technical mm -hmm. capabilities versus market reality when, say, building out a AI, VR, or uh, augmented reality solution. Yeah, you're talking about like scope between the partners. Yep. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I love that question because it, it does take a little bit of creativity and it's somewhat of a product, it's like a product management exercise, mm -hmm. right? And right. I think it's really great to Take the time to really open up both companies and open up the product roadmaps and say, hey, mm. where do you want to be in two years from now? What products are you going to have? What features will you have? And what would a partnership between us look like two or three years out? And then from there, let's work all the way back to what it looked like today. And then mm. tranche it until I always get rules of the rule of three, like three different phases again, right? And so going, to, so you have the big picture for a vision, but then come back to that what do we have right now? And what is the simplest thing we can do together to just get like a working demo, to get like a working demonstration that, that tests out other parts of the partnership. What is it like to work together? Do the engineers, if it's technical, get along well? Who's doing what? And then maybe even for free, but mm -hmm. under $100,000, what can we get to? And can we track that as being successful? And then I would also recommend looking at okay, we do this first batch of work together. Is there a lot of reuse, right? So you want to optimize for, for reuse of what you do to the next phase of what you're working towards. You don't want to go so 
so far up. So it's a really a, a nice product management exercise to scope that out and say, hey, let's make sure phase one meets this goal. And it's, you could clearly see that it's like on the way to the larger, bigger vision between the two companies. And then just put boundaries and lines around that so that if there's a schedule to it. It's clear who's going to be doing what resources might be involved. And that there is just checks, sorry, like milestones and check-ins along the way so that you can have some form of success relatively quickly. Like what can you be, get done in eight to 12 weeks, right? Wouldn't want to drag it out a whole year just to see something. Right. I'm also curious, where do you find most technical founders trip up when trying to quantify the value proposition of their offerings? That's a good question. I, I think it's often that they don't take a look at the second order benefits, right? They just, sometimes it's like you're, you might just be trying to quantify like how this is technically better than what they're using now. So that's great. So for example, if it, if it's some, um, if it's D2B SaaS, let's say, okay, maybe it is the fact that, Hey, you can do this workflow a little bit more quickly and you save a little bit of time. Okay, great. Or, but you want to look at also just communicate, Hey, if we save that time or if we save that money, what else can you do with that as well too? What else does that open up for you? Yeah, there's, there's first order technological benefits, but try to take a step up from there and say, hey, what business benefits are there? If it makes your employees happier to use that software, right? That's great. Maybe there's employee retention around that or something. So it's good to, to think through those. And, and that might come through uh, case studies with, like, with your customers and sitting down with them at a pretty deep level and trying to understand, like, hey, what else did this do for you that maybe... We didn't communicate up front. Capture those, share those. Yeah. You're, so you're, what is that classic line? You're selling the sizzle, not the steak or whatever it is, right? That's what you're going after. Which is an interesting point because uh, I'm also curious, how have you seen customer stories or case studies translate into revenue growth for startups that you work with? Uh, is this something that you actively encourage them to gather uh, and leverage in, in terms of these customer success stories? Yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that. I think, especially with these larger companies, they're doing so many things. They're so busy. If you're a startup trying to partner with these big guys, they want to be given a blueprint of what to do with working with someone like you, especially if you're doing something that's innovative. And there's nothing better than saying, Hey, we did this project that was pretty similar with this other really big company that may or may not be a competitor. And this is how we did it. And it's shocking how much the executive's ears perk up in that. Cause it's just like, okay, here was something that worked somewhere else, or maybe didn't work. Even if it didn't work, it's, it's grounded in something. And then we can adjust it for what we need to do here. The business is a little bit different and the times are a little different. The environment's different. We can go from there, but that story tends to, t tends to uh, stick even better in the executive's mind. Than anything you can be telling them, any suggestions that are conjecture on, hey, we should try it this way or that way. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how, how well that works to, to be able to share the story. For those who have limited early customers uh, to this point, uh, what would be your advice for proactively documenting, positioning those first customer success cases to build credibility? I think what's important there is to be in constant dialogue with the customers you have, right? Mm -hmm. Even the ones you're doing discovery with, if it's your zero to one situation and don't do this enough, but take notes, capture it, record the call even, right? Get those, get those early expressions, like what the customer's potential customer might even be saying about a demo you gave them, yeah. right? There's always like that aha moment, get the words down. Don't just synthesize it later because the way that it's said in that raw form is what is most believable and conveyable Mm -hmm. uh, to the next customer you, you might be talking to. So I like taking those clips. From there though, as you go through and get your first win, communicate the story to the second or third customers you might get on board. Mm -hmm. And I would also say the other thing that's underrated in that is try to put some structure around how you now work with these customers. Because buyers need to be told how to, to work with you, especially if you're doing something innovative and new, like they may not know. And then because you're a startup, you might think, oh, like, let's let this big company, especially if you're talking about these B2B deals, 
let's put this, let's put this big company, like buy the way that they want to buy. Mm-hmm. I get that. There's some amount of needs to happen because it's a company that's much bigger than yours with a lot of stakeholders. But as much as you can take the learnings you had from customer one and two and three and be like, Hey, we've worked with other companies that are similar to yours. This is how it worked well for them. It was three phases again, back to three, because I love three, there's three phases to this. And it happens over like four or five months. And these are the things we're going to work to a action plan. What? Push it this way because we will save time, save energy, right? And we'll and if we do that first two, you know, two or three months. We're going to qualify in out, so we don't waste time. We don't want to be here talking with you for seven months and have nothing happen. That's the worst thing that can happen, especially to a startup. But I know I'm going, I'm going uh, sideways here. But to a big company, that's not a, that's not a big problem. Yeah. They can talk to you for eight months. And then never speak to you again and say, hey, it's not going to work. And that's not a big loss to a big company. But to a startup, too much of that is that. So basically, record the early wins, set up structure in the sales funnel and communicate that to prospective customers and try to push them through that funnel as much as you can with that mutual action plan in place and like just qualify in out along the way as much as you can. Yeah. You work with a diverse range of startups and technical companies. So uh, where do you see founders get tripped up by pride and overconfidence that prevents predictable success? Yeah, I think it's, I think a lot of founders focus on fundraising and I get why. And I think too many of them allow that to be what they feel is an indicator of success and a fundraised business is not a fundraised startup is not a business. I'm going to say that provocatively for a reason, because a business, in my opinion, is, is some, is an organization that has created a product that a customer finds value in and would like to purchase at least at some level, even at a small level, I'll call that a business. But if you're a founder with a smart idea and then, oh, someone comes and throws a million dollars at you and says, Hey, we want you to go, you know, validate that idea. Now, nine times out of 10, you're going to be wrong just because you got funding doesn't mean you're right. And that's really cool that investors are willing to give you that runway to go figure that out, but you're not a business. So don't like you raise the money. Fantastic. But be very humble because I think this market is also teaching that to a lot of founders. Okay. The funding isn't there. Do you have a product that people actually want to buy? And so founders in that regard, especially if they're technical founders or they're founders that have worked at large companies, they come off of, let's say they were working at Google and they come out of Google and then, oh, investors go, oh my God, they were working at something at Google. We're going to throw $20 million out. And now they have 20 million, maybe even more. Some of them get $50 million and they, they come out of the race. Okay. We've got it all now, especially if they're doing something B2B. The fact of the matter is the guy that's been working at Google, no offense to him or her, but does not have the skill sense of what's required to be a founder, early stages B2B. You have to validate now if the product that you have is something that the market wants. And now you have to, and you don't have a Google brand behind you anymore. And so now take that confidence away and start li- going into the market and listening to the market and getting better at marketing and sales. So good product is no, fortunately not enough. So that's my recommendations. Like the fundraising is great, but learn how to do sales, learn how to do marketing, get out there and be humble and put a great product in front of people and then iterate and be willing to iterate and take feedback and not just be like, Hey, like this is my baby and everyone needs to accept it. Right. That's that's just not how the world works. In in the space of startups and te- technological partnerships, do you find that there's perhaps a couple of areas that don't get much airtime? If so, what would they be? Topics that don't get airtime? I mean, yeah. yeah. A lot of conversation around fundraising, without a doubt. I'm going to probably lean into how important sales might be early on in a company, right? And especially if it's more B2B focused 
And I think sales, people have said this before, it's a very dirty word, right? People don't like it, but ultimately when you're a founder of an early stage business, before you go hire someone to do it for you, you have to do it. Yeah. And that means you have to be okay with rejection and you have to be okay with putting yourself out there. And I just think it's a skill that everybody should develop at some point in their career. And in particular, if you're going to be a founder, you need to not be scared of it. You need to learn it and get good at it. And because your ability to find product market fit in B2B is going to somewhat depend on it. Mm -hmm. And you need to figure out what that motion looks like before you go and hire for it. And the cost of not doing that is you hire the wrong person too early. And now you've spent, you've compromised that person's career. And now you've also compromised your business, right? And so I think it's something that doesn't take, it's not rocket science. Go read two, three books on it. Start to practice those principles and implement that as early as you can. Mm, terrific. Advice that. And looking to wrap up here, Varaj. So if you were listening to this episode, what would mm -hmm. you say would be your top takeaway? I would say a top takeaway is in the context of fundraising and even partnerships, right? It is, it is, in my opinion, best done in a relationship, somewhat relationship driven sales approach, right? Mm -hmm. And, or, and trying to cover all the elements that make a good partnership or a good deal. Mm -hmm as early as possible and working through those at a human level is probably the most efficient and most enjoyable way to do business. Mm. Right. And uh, for listeners who are curious, want to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? Yeah, the best place is probably LinkedIn. I'm most active on LinkedIn. If you just type in V-A-R-A-G, I'm probably the first one that comes up. Very rare <laughs> Armenian name. <laughs> you can find me there. I'm pretty active and, and send me a message if you'd like to connect. No problem. Okay. We'll include a link to that in the show notes. Rag, this has been terrific. We've uh, covered uh, what is perhaps uh, just the tip of the iceberg, but um, uh, okay. it's, it's certainly been a very enlightening. Thank you for doing this. Benane, thank you. I think you asked very brilliant questions. So keep doing what you do. <laughs>